Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the Royal Armouries, the National Firearms Centre in Leeds, UK, uh, courtesy of Ares Armament Research Services, and we are taking a look at the XL70 series of British bullpup rifles and light support weapons. Now this is kind of the, the middle, right in the middle of the story of the development of the SA-80 series of firearms, and at this point in the story, Kind of the, the mechanical design of the gun has finally been finished. So in the last video with the, uh, the XL60 series of guns, we were looking at changes to selector levers and changes to safeties and a lot of these mechanical elements. And by this stage in the process, they'd taken all the input from this, this, the previous series of guns and they'd come up with a final design. And this is it. They made a couple of other changes at the same time. They changed from a square basically square body or receiver to this slightly triangular one that you can see. And this is really aesthetically the final version of what the L85 and L86 would look like. So the goal was that this would be pretty much the last version, that there was only a few little tweaks that they would need to do and then they could actually start making production rifles. Unfortunately that's not really how the project worked out. but. By this point, the project, the development was always already running behind schedule and over budget, and there was a lot of political concern that the guns had to actually work. And, and this is where we start getting a lot of serious problems with the rifle family. When these guns went into trials, the goal was to have, they were measuring uh, MRBS, mean round between failure, MRBF, and the idea being on average, how many rounds can you fire before you have a malfunction? And the goal was to have 2,500 rounds on the individual rifle and 8,000 on the light support weapon. The idea being that the, the light machine gun version is going to be firing a lot more ammunition and in order to have the same practical reliability you need to have a higher MRBF. Well, as the actual trials went, these numbers were coming back in the low hundreds. 100 to 300 rounds between failures. That is a huge problem. And so there are two ways that you could deal with this. One would be to fix all of the endemic problems with the gun so that it stopped malfunctioning. The other would be to redefine the, the, the meaning of failure and squiggle with the numbers until you hit the goal. And they kind of did the latter. So the malfunctions that these rifles had in, in shooting were divided into three different types, minor, serious, and critical. A minor malfunction was something basically that could be immediately, that could be cured by an immediate action drill. So a minor malfunction would be, doesn't quite feed right, tap the bolt handle forward, okay then it's ready to go and you can fire. A serious malfunction is something that required disassembly to cure. And a critical function malfunction was something that literally could not be fixed by the shooter on the line. So for example, if the bottom half of the bolt sheared off, that would be considered a critical failure. If you know, a pin came loose and you had to pull apart the gun and put it back into position, that was considered a serious failure. In addition to this, the testing kind of became focused more on safety than on reliability. As it became clear that the guns had a lot of malfunctioning troubles, the emphasis was pushed to making sure that they were safe, that they weren't going to explode and hurt someone, and ignoring, kind of minimizing the fact that these trials in theory were also there to determine reliability. If you actually, when you massage the numbers, what they decided to do was stop including minor and serious malfunctions in the number count. And in addition, and this is actually arguably valuable. They, they took numbers only from the endurance trials and not from, say, the mud test or the sand test or the, the water test. They were only taking malfunction numbers from the endurance trials, which is where you, in theory, aren't doing anything to the gun except shooting it. You're not trying to put it in harsh conditions. And then they only counted critical malfunctions. And do, even doing this, they were unable to really even come close to reaching the goal numbers. Once you massaged the data that way, you were getting MRBFs of 1,000 to 1,500 rounds, which is still not good. When you think about that, step back and think about that, that's you know, one in 1,000 rounds, something will go so critically wrong with the gun that you have to send it back to the armorer to fix. Like barrel splitting, like uh, bolt carriers cracking, bolts shearing locking lugs. These were malfunctions that they were having. Um, 
you had a combination of mechanical problems with the gun, and a lot of this stems from the fact that the original design team at Enfield was not made up of gun designers or people who had extensive experience with firearms. They were talented engineers, but they didn't know the details of the guns. So, for example, here's a good, a, a good, just one of many issues that came up. They're having problems with, you know, just a lot of failures to fully lock, malfunctions on feed and extraction. And so at one point they actually brought Jim Sullivan over for a consultation. He had designed the AR-15, he'd had a hand in the AR-18, he was an expert gun designer. And what he did was take a magazine, load it, put it in the gun, chamber around, then take the magazine out, pull that cartridge out carefully and examine it up close. And what he found were a lot of scratches in the cartridge. What this means is that during that feeding process, it was scraping on things like the magazine feed lips, most importantly, the, the front sharp corners of the bolt locking lugs, because of course, if you have a cartridge here, it's going to be pushed up by the locking lugs, and those locking lugs potentially are going to scrape on the cartridge below it as well. Um, and then the, the actual locking lugs in the barrel extension, the cartridge is going to scrape up across those and in if the feed path isn't really well engineered. Now, okay, you may look at it and go, well, what does it matter? You've got some scratches on the cartridge. Maybe in theory, if you deform the bullet a bit, you'll get accuracy problems, but that's it. In fact, what was happening was you were getting little scraped off pieces of brass that were dropping into the rear trunnion, into the locking log areas. And one of those isn't going to be a problem, and two probably won't be a problem, but over the course of extended firing, those are going to build up, and sooner or later, you're going to get one or several jammed into an area where they're going to cause a malfunction. And it's going to be erratic, weird malfunctions, because they're going to end up in, in a lot of different places. And it's not something, if you don't have a lot of experience with firearms design, it's not something you'll necessarily recognize and then figure out. That's a good example of the kind of core problems that they were having with these guns. Now, the materials engineering was another side of this. Um, some of the material specs were being predefined for them by the MOD, and they weren't necessarily the proper ones or the ideal ones. Um, some of the material specs were being chosen by people who clearly didn't really know what was best for the guns. Um, at one point in this process, they did have a whole run of, of bolts with a new steel design that just sheared half the bolts off within a few rounds of, of being proofed. Subst I mean, that's a huge problem. And they were having that in this testing, which was supposed to be like the last version of, okay, we're just about there and we just need to fine tune it. That's not when you're supposed to have bolts cracking in half. Another example of this sort of uh, fabrication misdirection was with the firing pins. They were breaking quite a lot. And it turned out that what was happening was uh, Enfield was manufacturing the outside of the bolt exactly to spec, and then they were using the bolt as the jig for drilling the firing pin hole. Well, the problem is the firing pin hole is a very long and very small diameter hole, and the drills used to make that hole just naturally tend to walk a bit. And so they don't they always come out exactly, exactly parallel in line with where you start the hole on the back of the bolt. This is okay. One way to solve this would be to drill the hole first and then machine the bolt around it so that the bolt is parallel to the firing pin hole. The problem is if you don't, you can end up with a slightly curved firing pin hole, and not very much, but then every time you fire, the firing pin is bending as it moves back and forth through the firing pin hole, and over a lot of repetitions, that's going to lead to broken firing pins. Magazines were also another major issue for the guns. The magazines were being made by Radway Green. They weren't particularly reliable. Um, they ended up in, when they went to adopt the gun, they formally adopted it using Colt magazines as well, Colt M16 magazines, which would actually work much more reliably. Simultaneous to all of these other problems, there are also major pressures to reduce the cost of the rifle. As development time goes on and on, the development cost gets higher, and as a result, the end cost of the rifles is slowly creeping up. And there's a lot of political pressure to fix this. Drop the price of the rifles. They have to be cheap. One of the founding principles of the SA-80 program was that it would be a lot cheaper than the FAL, the SLR, and the M240 that it would be replacing. As the prices go up, this becomes a political problem. So a lot of steps are also being taken to reduce the cost. And this involves things like 
using lower quality materials, using lighter weight sheet steel, simplifying things, reducing the, the complexity of items where complex features were sometimes the specific things that were required in order to keep the gun reliable. Uh, a good example of this is the, the receivers, um, what they call the, the body housing of the gun. It ended up being light enough that it could actually was liable to twist. And without a lot of reinforcing corners, um, without shaping to it, it was possible to grip the gun too tightly and tweak its exact shape, which would cause the bolt to jam up, slow down, extra friction, and malfunction. All of these things are working together just to really wreak havoc with the reliability of the guns. And at the same time, there's a continued push that they have to be ready, they have to be ready, they have to be adopted, we're on a schedule, and we've spent too much time and money at this already to admit that there are fundamental problems with the guns. And it's an interesting program in that, in some ways, it actually, the guns actually got progressively worse as they went through the design process because of the cost-cutting measures. Normally, you'd expect the worst performing guns to be the very first ones. In this case, those early 4.85 millimeter rifles were really remarkably good compared to a lot of the guns that would be emerging from the XL70 series and the XL85 that we're going to look at next. So uh, let's take a closer look at these two. Uh, we'll pull them apart and just look at a few of the finalized design ideas in them. And then we'll go ahead and follow this up with another video on the XL85 series. So let's take a closer look at the XL70 here. One thing to point out is that as they had a number of different versions of these guns, as they were further developed and the difference between the right hand and the left hand and the individual weapons and the machine guns, by the way, they went back and forth through this development program about calling the larger gun a light support weapon or a machine gun. Both terms were used. At any rate, the point I'm getting at is these guns, every single different version had its own number. So this is an XL70E3. You can see here on this LSW, this is the exact same set of features, but this one is an XL73E2 as opposed to an XL70E3. Uh, really quite a complicated numbering system. But if we look at these, a couple of the distinctive features that we can see, I'm going to include this plastic dust cover, it's the early version of the dust cover. You have to push it back slightly, and then it runs under this little welded tab. One of the most significant changes made here was they added an extension to the magazine well. This was done to better control the exact angle of the magazine, but it's a bit curious that they did it by making a separate piece, the bottom half of the magazine well, and then welding it on. Now the reason for this was because they were stamping the body housing out of a single piece of steel front to back, this all started as a flat and it was bent into shape and that was pretty economical to do because it's not very complicated as a stamping goes. However, when you try to add this, you can no longer do it all in one piece. Now there were a couple of ways this could be done. They could have been split in half and then seam welded on the bottom, which would have been a remarkably good way to do it. Or you could make this as a separate piece on its own, which is not the best way but feasible. But then the idea to weld it in place is kind of questionable. Um, one might consider that you would lose a lot of your tolerances by welding it on like that. At any rate, they did have a reinforcing uh, piece of heavy gauge steel in here, which I'm sure is the biggest reason that this welded on magazine extension works. That lines up with the back of the magazine rib and allows the magazine to sit nicely in position. Uh, this is one of the Radway Green Aluminum Magazines, and it is extremely light. It's in fact too light. Um, the material is definitely too thin. It is reputedly, it is possible if you squeeze a little too hard, you could actually stop the column of cartridges from going up the magazine just from hand pressure. Now on this side of the gun, we have the final version of the magazine release, which is a push button. It is unprotected here. So this was one of the, the problems that troops ran into in the field is you could easily depress that against your body or your gear and drop the magazine without intending to or without realizing it. They have a lever style of fire selector. R is repetition, A is automatic. Works like that. And that's the final version you'll see in production guns. And then the safety remained as this cross bolt pin. So again, this is the, the final version like you'll see in 
standard issue guns. Now, these did have an early stamped steel trigger. That would change a little bit uh, in later years. And by the way, this is a little bit loose because the, the rear retaining pin here is missing. Um, not, not a problem with the gun, just this specific example is missing its pin. Now the light support weapon here is a little bit different. We have a little bit more to talk about with this. It's got all the same basic mechanics on the back end of the gun, but this has simply a bipod mounted to uh, the front end of the handguard, or mounted to the barrel at the front of the handguard. This bipod design would change with the final adopted version because of the biggest single problem, as far as I can tell, that the L86 had, and that is split groups. It was found that on when firing fully automatic, the first round fired would go pretty much to point of aim, and then the entirety of the rest of the burst would shoot high and to the left at about 10, maybe 11 o'clock. And substantially so. At 300 yards, the, the group, the center of the main group, would be about 18 inches away from the first round. Now, this turned out to be a pretty vexing problem for Enfield to try and figure out and fix. And what they ended up doing to fix it was adding basically a girder. They added an extension down here from the receiver that came all the way out to the muzzle. And they mounted the bipod out here on the girder and they affixed it to the barrel. Um, apparently what they were finally able to do was get some really good high speed video of the barrel upon firing and discovered that it was kind of wobbling around quite a lot. The girder system didn't completely fix the problem, but it fixed it well enough that they were then able to apply some creative mathematics to the accuracy numbers and some creative redefinition to the accuracy requirements and get the gun good enough to pass muster, uh, at least politically. The one other thing they did to the LSW was replace this, the XL70 pattern of muzzle brake, which has just a number of holes in it, with the, the larger, more heavy duty, more effective flash hider from the GPMG, uh, the FN mag. So between the, the girder and the muzzle brake, they were able to make things better. So disassembly is going to start with two pins. This particular rifle is missing the rear pin, which actually makes it a little simpler for us. We're gonna take this pin, push it through. <laughs> right there, it's a little tight. We pull that out, it is captive. Then the trigger housing rotates off the bottom of the gun. Now it's important that normally when you do this, you want to be a little careful with the recoil um, assembly here because it will come out. This one is quite tight. So once we're at this point, we can then pull the recoil assembly out of the gun. There we go. Now by the XL70 series, the recoil assembly had been changed substantially. Uh, earlier pattern guns had basically an AR-18 style with two smaller diameter rods that each had a recoil spring on them. Here we have two heavier duty rods to, in theory, be a stronger control for the travel of the bolt, and then a single center rod with a single recoil spring. Once that's out, then we can take the bolt out. Very simple, just pull it all the way back. The charging handle comes off, the bolt handle comes off, and then the bolt comes out. At this point, they had finally fixed the bolt design so they no longer have this huge undercut for the extractor. Um, the extractor is a much more reasonable, reasonably designed piece, but the rest of the bolt body is basically exactly the same as on previous versions. This is still an AR-18 bolt. At the front end of the gun, we have an upper handguard here, the top of which is hinged, so I can just... Basically the exact same gas system. It is adjustable up at the front. Um, and then you can remove all of these bits to clean it. This is one of the unfortunate places where on most guns with this style of gas system, the gas system itself is virtually maintenance free, but because of the eventual manufacturing tolerances on the L85s, at one point the recommendation was that you were supposed to disassemble and clean the gas system every 300 rounds, which is insanely often for a system like this, but that's what it required to run reliably. There you have them, a pair of intermediate developmental SA-80s, these being from the XL70 series of guns. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video in our continuing saga on the SA-80 family of firearms. I'd like to thank the Royal Armories, the National Firearms Center here, for allowing me to take a look at these guns. If you are interested in visiting, it is open by appointment only, um, although not open to the general public. 
definitely if you're doing research on guns like this, give them a call, get in touch, and come take a look. I'd also like to thank Armament Research Services for making this trip possible for me. If you're interested in these particular guns, make sure to also check out Armament Research Services. Their link is in the description text below. They will be posting high-definition pictures of these two in specific as the video goes up. Thanks for watching.